Tonight we are very happy to be hosting this meeting as part of the Cambridge Festival. It has become something of a tradition for the Milrow History Society to be given this opening slot. So we're very proud of our position. And first of all, we have three speakers from organisations based in the Milrow area. So we've got Angie Stewart from the Cambridge Women's Aid, Laura Alani from Cambridge Aid Crisis Centre, and Steph Martin Barker from the Cambridge Community Resources, who is doing something along with our very own Ida. So they will talk about the um, early years of their organisations, the issues they were set up to tackle, what they do now, and the current services they provide. The evening will take a slightly different form to usual. Each presentation will last 20 minutes, followed by a 10 minute slot for questions and comments. So we aim to finish by nine. It's a little bit over slightly so it's okay, but you can help us at the end by stacking your chairs <laughs> <laughs> so you get out on time. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we're really looking forward to uh, being here. Thanks. And thank you all for coming out on this horrible day. I'm not in the program, and I'm going to do a like to Stan, the Chief Executive Officer of Cambridge Women's Resources Centre. My name is Ida Chandavarka, and I'm currently on the CWRC Management Committee, but I've had a very long association with CWRC, so I thought I'd like to talk about the beginning. I joined as an employee in January 1984, and CWRC actually opened in November 1983. The reason we talk about this year being our 40th anniversary is because September 1982 was when the women set it up first met. And particularly for a women's organization, we feel the need to recognize and respect the value of unpaid work. And I apologize if the images aren't great quality. They're all from old photographs and newspaper cuttings, but I hope they'll give you a sense of, of the early days of CWRC. So setting up CWRC was hard work. The women came together at the now almost forgotten women's centre in the Kite area. Many had been involved with the centre of Cambridge Women's Aid and felt it was really important to have a complementary organisation that could help women from the refuge others like them, secure the employment and money that they needed for a more independent life. So here's a picture of Julie Bailey, one of the coordinators, giving thank you flowers to Jack Gordon, who was a key woman in the group setting up CWRC. I found it really useful preparing for this, because it's really good to reflect on the time. It was very different politically. The women's movement in the 60s and 70s had made visible the discrimination that women faced. The first signal of change, I wonder how many of you remember this, <laughs> was in the US, Betty Friedman's publication of the She spoke of a problem that lay buried, unspoken, in the mind of the average woman, utter boredom and lack of fulfillment. Women were deadened by domesticity and they were too socially conditioned to recognize their own desperation. This resonated with many women and led to NOW, the National Organization of Women. Now, in trying to write a Bill of Rights for Women in 1967, found consensus on six measures essential to ensuring women's equality. Enforcement of laws banning employment discrimination, maternity leave rights, childcare centers that could enable mothers to work. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> this is 1970s, 1960s. Tax deductions for childcare expenses, equal and unsegregated education, and equal job training opportunities, particularly for. Similar women's movements started in the UK and the now clauses were universally adopted by the strong women's movements. All this publicity that meant that whether people agreed with the campaigns or not, there was common ground when women raised similar issues in Cambridge, something that was then understood by local authorities and similar bodies 
even if they didn't actually give us money to help bring in change. These six demands became core to the formation of CWRC. And there was other differences. The women's rights movement also brought in an understanding that all women faced unfavorable conditions in a patriarchal society that could lead to <coughs> women not having relevant work experience. It was felt that one way forward was for women to share skills to build that experience. Skill sharing also ushered in a new way of working, to work in a non-hierarchical way, so that the first management committee at CWRC was a collective with no chair. And when they employed staff, these employees were also a collective to manage and run the new centre. I had the grand title of clinical worker when I joined. <laughs> but I had the same management responsibilities as everyone else. I couldn't find a picture of the management collective. This is a meeting of the staff collective. So how did CWRC start? Through successful visioning and networking. A connection with Lisa Jali, the first woman fellow at Jesus College, helped the management collective secure a college building on Station Road. It had not been used for quite some time and was really run down. <laughs> Cambridge City Council actually gave a grant of 10,000 to do up the building and members of the management collective pitched in to renovate, clean and paint. It was with some pride that they were able when they needed external services to employ women. For example, Josie, a carpenter provided the CWRC with excellent desks for the computer courses. That's actually not a desk used for the computer courses, <laughs> but it was one that was produced at CWRC. The building had two big rooms, the one on the ground floor was used as a crash, and the one on the first floor was the computer and course room. There was a small room on the ground floor that served as office space. Actually, it looks bigger in the photograph, but it was really crowded. And the crash. We actually had a crash, and the crash took babies from the time they were born, all pre-school children. Margaret Wilson, who was the crash coordinator at the time, marked out a little area in front of the building which served as outdoor space for the children. I couldn't actually find a picture of that, but I know Veronica has some pictures, so I hope we'll be able to get some. This outside space in the courtyard might have been enclosed from a common courtyard, but nobody objected. And I think this was very much the early philosophy of CWRC. They claimed what you can use well to benefit women and children. <laughs> in 1983, CWRC was successful in securing a Manpower Services Commission grant for staff salaries, but hadn't yet finalized the funds for computers for the vocational. So the centre opened with the help of women supporters who ran a variety of non-vocational courses for a small fee per session to help pay costs. That's one of our early programmes. And you can see there's a listing there, courses for fun. The courses I can remember were assertiveness, verbal disarmament, woodwork, DIY, video production, drag shafi, self-defence, tai chi, yeah, so various exercise classes, and I'm sure there are many more. So let's look again at an early program from 1987. And next to it is uh, the computer courses being advertised. Oh, you can. I don't know if you can make up the date, but it's actually 1984. So it was one of the first computer courses. And look at the bold lettering free childcare. And um, also, that welcome to women of all ages and abilities, and plus a more positive welcome to those groups of women we felt were often marginalized. We had actually stumbled on something that would add to CWRC's success. Not all women wanted or felt they were ready for vocational training. This mixture of vocational and fun courses brought many more women to the center, and there was often a very useful crossover. 
is Margaret of the Creche, and she's the Creche not only to look after the children, but to talk to the mothers of children. And often it was these Creche conversations that led to women deciding what they wanted to do. It also helped women disclose trauma and abuse to get the support they needed to move on. You can see Margaret with her magnifying glass giving a woman information, it's either a useful service or information on any issue. And I'd like to thank also the most wonderful range of women who work or volunteer for the crash. Sometimes it was the staff that they work. As I said, I got the job as a terrible worker, but I was approached almost immediately by the then computer tutor, who said she had another job and asked if I'd run a computer course she had set up as I had some computer experience. It's hard to believe now, I'm quite illiterate. Um, I agreed. There were 13 women who had enrolled for a 12 place course, and I rang around till I could persuade one to join the next course. By the time we ran the next course, a month later, there were over 200 applications. I'm not sure where this was taken. It could have been taken at one of the open events we ran to introduce uh, our computer courses. I found that the best learning on the was not showing women how to use a computer. It was getting a group of women together who all had a break from paid employment and seeing their recognition that followed that it was not an individual issue that they faced to feel distance from the field of paid work. It was something that happened to all women, particularly when they had children. They might have gone into a relationship as equals, but once the children arrived, caring responsibilities could make the relationship an unequal. This recognition was the start of a new confidence. Here's a picture of some of the women with their children who came to the initial computer training courses. Many went on to be well known in what they went on to do. And even though it was a computer course, we included discussion sessions on women's rights as well as on different areas of work. You can see the value of women only space for this, and we used feedback to design course material. For example, we had a specialist CV workshop for women who had not breaks from a pain employment. Throughout, the concept of skill sharing led to more interactive sessions with peer learning. We also had a night room. This was in Hoover Street, not Station Road. Sorry, I don't know where the picture of the library is, but uh, it had uh, many feminist books like Man Made Language by Dale Spender, lots of novels from uh, Virago and the Women's Press, and we still have all the issues of Spare in that were published. So, here we are. I think one of our re the greatest regrets, that's probably the library, in uh, leaving Hoover Street was to lose the space for the library and coffee room where many memorable discussions And at that time, in Hooper Street, we even had a smoker's room. <laughs> Many non-smokers joined because of the conversations. <laughs> CWRC success was evident, and we were helped by Cambridge City Council councillors to move to Hooper Street when the art deck moved out. The new building, which had disabled access, we were able to see thousands of women a year and increase the range of courses, for example, introducing new courses in numeracy and literacy. Here's one of the depreciative comments that we had. Uh, CWRC also helped found and run the Women's Training Network, a network of some 26 similar women's organizations across the UK. And I don't know how many of them are left now, but it's certainly not 26. And at one point, uh, the Women's Training Network organized a campaign trip to the European Parliament to lobby successfully for, to change the European Social Fund procedures around childcare because they initially counted this in the cost of training provision, making women's centres applications more expensive. And we were successful at that. It wasn't all smooth progress. <laughs> I think fighting for change really is. Five women joined CWRC as employees and three resigned in the first three months of the centre opening. <laughs> the 
management collected and then he decided to leave and employed staff and felt they could take more of a backseat role and to in turn to take a more active role. And I'd really like to thank all of this, all of those who did this, because they gave time for weekly meetings so things settled down. And there were women who also helped with managing the vocational of computer courses. And the skill sharing was wonderful. I was given all the materials I needed for a bookkeeping course we wanted to run by Marion, who worked for the Cambridge Cooperative Development Agency. And I was shown the practical side of bookkeeping by Mandy and Sue, who did the finance. I was also shown how to write funding applications to local authorities and to the European Social Fund. And these are all skills that I still use in my work today. As I said, we had the support from many councillors and staff at Cambridge City Council. Cambridge Account Council, but this didn't mean that everyone understood the need for a women's centre. So if you can read this, it's Pat Robertson who says, feminism encourages women to leave their husbands, kill their children, practice witchcraft, destroy <laughs> capitalism, and become lesbians. <laughs> to be a patron of CWRC replied, I don't think we need to keep this flag flying in Cambridge. <laughs> and that was one of the nice settings. <laughs> we saw the disproportionately higher amount of funding given to the youth IT organization, along with uh, building on the street, when it was clear the needs were similar and that there were as many women as young people When the Hoover Street iTech was opened by the Queen, Penny Ockley, who was both on the CWRC Management Collective and iTech board, was introduced to Prince Philip as someone who had helped set up a similar training center for women. I can't remember what he said, but there was something very rude about the need of training for women. <laughs> Similarly, when I rang the company who sold us computers to ask about delivery, I heard the person who answered the phone shout, Hey, Brian, it's your father, Meinhof. <laughs> and the two men who delivered the computers couldn't control their giggling as they delivered them. I realized why when I was invited to one of the company dues and found the only other women there were secretaries and stiletto meals serving the drinks. And that was 1984. I think we've forgotten some of the pressures of the time. The contraceptive bill, the abortion act, and the revision to the Married Women's Property Act were all 60s legislation. The first Equal Pay Act was in 1970, following the Dagenham Ford Women's Strike. So in the early 80s, these were all new rights with emerging legislation. It helped women at CWRC feel they had rights, and it was okay for them to take this journey to be themselves. It was the right time then for CWRC to focus on support for women in line with the now rights that I talked about ensure support for childcare, to provide job training opportunities, and campaign against employment discrimination. But it quickly became something much more. The discussions in the crash were to provide the staff of much broader based support to combat women's poverty, isolation, and any abuse they faced. I think we all felt that we helped bring about a more broad based understanding of what needed to be provided. And these services benefited more than the service users. I know it changed my life and the lives of many who taught or volunteered or helped manage the centre. It helped many, many women make that journey to be able to be themselves and to gain the freedom to lead the lives they wanted. I'm going to hand you over to Seth.
vertical dungaree wearing feminists, which just made me so proud. <laughs> I was just like, this house is amazing. I feel like I found all my people. Um, so I'm Steph Martinson Barker. I've been CEO for nearly seven years now. Oh, you did that for a And I'm just going to kind of go through the service that we do now. Obviously, you've heard about where we've been and where we've been. <coughs> So, actually, what we do, and it's amazing really, isn't actually much different from where we started. We're still there to empower women, we're still there to partnership work, and we're still there to strengthen the voice in the communities women can see. Lovely quote there that I love. A girl should be uh, two things who and what she wants, which I think is amazing. Um, so, what we do now, so one we do now still obviously support women. We work a lot directly with women through groups, courses, activities still to choose to have choice, um, increase awareness and information, and to walk alongside other women um, and not to dictate what they should or should be doing. We may not always agree with it, and the choices may be limited, but we're there to support women to have their own choice, be empowered in that when they want to. Partnership working is absolutely crucial, it's something that we are very good at um, and, and it's something that reduces a vast amount of barriers, it increases opportunities for women and it also tackles a lot of the patriarchy and stuff going on in society. Um, we collaborate with voice, um, raise awareness, promote and increase voice for women locally, regionally and nationally and that is absolutely key I think to everything we do. Um, so there are some projects which we run. Uh, Employability in Home is something that's funded by the County Council, City Council, sorry, I'm not sure that's wrong. Um, and it's supporting women into education training and courses, which is really kind of keeping hold of the core thing that CWRC was set up to do. And that's really important that we hold on to that because, like I said, you know, one of the findings is that people don't always want to go straight into vocational. People want to meet other women, want to practice skills, start things, finish things, take safe risks, and just meet other women in the community. Skill sharing is a massive thing which we still do and is still very, very popular. Birth to Medium for Change is supporting pregnant women who have been victims of crime or negative experiences. Um, currently unfunded, so if anyone would like to fund or donate to that, we are taking donations. Um, and that's really key, that supports women, um, no matter what the outcome of pregnancy is, in, in various different ways to rewrite the support they're accessing. And freedom and freedom further, um, which is awareness of the system that we use on our um, One of the things I wanted to talk about, actually, before I kind of go on to this, is some of the impacts of commissioning decisions. And I'm sure there might be some other discussions about that tonight. But we ran the Dawn Project for 10 years. Um, and I think I'm really frustrated at some of the commissioning decisions, both locally, regionally, and nationally, that seem to be diluting um, the, the importance of gender specific services. And the Dawn Project was one of that, that we unfortunately lost out um, on some points uh, over just misleading and commissioning. But I think this is, you know, we aren't isolated in that, and the amount of women that have been impacted by women's services not delivering that, and then delivering it in a kind of generic way, is huge. I mean, on that project alone, three women have died in, in, since that, that was commissioned, and I think that this is something we really need to draw attention to when we're seeing government making decisions about services. Anyway, on to the impact of cost of living. So we have seen more women face multiple debt-related issues, women who we haven't seen for 10, 15, 20 years, who have been running successful businesses, who have been living successful lives, who haven't, who've had money left over at the end of the month, who really now are in trouble. Some of that is to do with the pandemic, and some of that is to do with the cost of living, and then some of that is to do with all of those together, which has just massively impacted women and their access to, you know, their um, unable to afford basic living costs. We see so many women coming through who don't know whether to pay their rent or 
their energy bills or the food or childcare or clothing or you know the car because they need to access that to work. You know, so there are so many there's a real juggling act and it's really disheartening for staff when you go through someone's budget and there's nothing that you can do, there's nothing else that they can access. And that I think is a real barrier to the women at the moment. Or well, even at the moment. Uh, reduced family time due to extra working hours. We've got a lot of women who are going to take second and third jobs, which is really impacting their home life. You know, they're working in excess of hours. Risk of housing loss or insecure tenancy is reality. Unfortunately, we do a lot of work around exploitation, cuckooing, modern slavery. We see, we've seen, I would say, about 20% of our women are engaging in online work. Some of it, you know, in OnlyFans is the bane of our life. <laughs> it really is. Because people see it as an Instagram plus type thing and they don't realise that it may impact their actual employment or their careers or their qualifications. You know, teachers, nurses, midwives police officers, stuff like that. And so we're doing a lot of education around awareness for that. Sex and rape, um, we, we have a high but not high majority of women. There's a lot of women who are being used um, because they can't pay rent and find it to the landlords, being encouraged into sex pathways. And in a, inability to leave situations due to financial insecurity, women said, I just can't afford to leave. I can't, you know, the options just aren't there for me. I can't afford to process, I can't afford to move transport that it, it takes to do so. So really, you know, it's quite dire for women at the moment. What is cookery? Sorry. <laughs> what is cookery? So it's where you've got a tenancy or a property yeah. and um, people take over that tenancy or property while you're still living there. So it could be to sell drugs from, it could be to sell sex from, it could be, you know, anything along those lines, but it's you, your tenancy is taken over by someone else. So, like I say, very short to it, in a, a really nice bit of time to kind of talk about our history. But that's what, that's the situation we're in today. And I, I, I just really feel like we haven't actually moved on that far. And that some of the, 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 the power and the movement from the 60s, 70s and 80s, I don't remember the 60s and 70s, but the mid-80s, um, you know, it, it doesn't feel like it's there now for women. And I think that really is, you know, how do we how do we establish that? How do we create that movement again and that kind of pushing for it? And that's quite interesting thing. So yes, I'll hand over to the are we doing questions? Yes. Are we going to have the other ten minutes? Yeah. Well five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry. So uh, do you want to take any questions in the for yourself rather than Yeah, does anyone have any questions or do you want me to pass over to the lovely Emma? What's OnlyFans? <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> no, no, it's really so OnlyFans is um, it's a web-based um, website where women or, or anyone can go on, and it's it's like social media, but you engage in kind of more sexually provocative marketing-based things. So people can buy time with you. It's a, you know a bit like Instagram, but a bit sexier. Um, and so people can take it as far as they can. Does it have that underground on it? Yeah, it is good. It's, it's sort of like online forced prostitution. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's not quite porn hub, but it's you know a bit before that. Porn hub is a sex site. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Starting with four, so we're quite huge, and we um, obviously have uh, we've got volunteers uh, working for centres. We've got a centre in Cambridge. Yeah. 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 We've got a centre in Cambridge, and we've got a centre in Peterborough. So we've had a centre in Peterborough. Oh, yeah. um, yeah. So we're, we're, we're working on now, which is fantastic. Um, and we've got a funding profile of about three hundred. 
bit harder to get funding in Peterborough because it's yeah. a unitary council. So there's all the problems of social care and education. Whereas yeah. because in Cambridge there's a two-tier council. It's, e it's not easy, but it's better for the Cambridge City Council in terms of grants. Yeah. You know what you're saying that we don't feel that we've got a lot. I don't feel we've got a lot. But um, how can we change that? What can we do to change that? Is it for all these years? show was that actually when the centre started, there was more support for the issues that women were raising because of the whole movements of the 70s and 80s. I think what we're seeing is something where it's becoming less visible um, under the kind of commissioning that uh, Steph was talking about. And, uh, you know, I don't know if it's in the search for that society did, but certainly there are sanctions. But this is a for women because of their caring responsibilities. So there's a whole range of things from across the women that are hitting women harder. Um, and I think that's, that's something we need to get more focus on. But I think one of the things we're doing as you can see we're here we're doing this with uh, with Steph and Steph is doing this 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 with and we hope that we can continue campaigns through that. Children affected by domestic 
abuse. That, that, that is it. That is the main thing that we do. I mean, we live and we breathe it. That is our main business. And we do that by providing safe refuge, an outreach and community based service, support for children. Um, and tonight, if we do get into conversations, just a little reminder, she you don't need to be but if you do know the address of the refuge, please don't mention it tonight, particularly on Comfort com Film. So, um, even if you've lived in a refuge and you don't think we've got any more, don't mention that address either. But um, I'm sure all of you are going to do that. So, we are um, a registered charity. We're employed at um, employed paid workers. Being a registered charity, having independence, that matters a lot to us, that we're local. Roots. We've got our own decision making ability, we can bring in funding, we can decide how to spend that funding, which matters a great deal because it means that we can be responsive to women who are in crisis, um, and that, that's very, very important. We've got paid workers, so we have low staff turnover, a high expert team, all around very passionate women who are very dedicated and give so much to the work actually. I think you, you don't do the work for anything else other than the passion as well. Very, very clear. Currently, we've got 12 workers, um, but we are small, we're service user led, and our service is shaped by the women that we work for and their needs. What is it they need? How do they need us to respond to them? And their voice has got to be the one that we listen to. And actually, when we're talking about where is the passion gone, I think sometimes we have got a little bit corrupted by funding. Our funds will come along, or the money that people hold to have these institutional dynamics. They want us to do so. Claire, I'm in a meeting. Can I go? Can we be back? I'm at the top. Sorry. And we work very hard to make sure that all the policies are fair. And so some we have a survivors conference that we do annually. We bring women together to with the agencies that are supposed to support them and let them hear what their experiences are around, around that. We make sure that we employ women who have used our services or have lived the experience of domestic abuse. But that's not difficult because it is so prevalent actually. I think most women have got direct experience of it or experience of it within their family. Because, you know, we remember that we are them and they are us. Domestic abuse doesn't just happen to other people, it happens to us, the people that we love, the people in our families. So no one is immune. So we were established in 1977 by the Cambridge Women's Liberation Network. I think we started meeting around 76 actually. I was going through the archives, but we've lost a year somewhere. So I keep telling you the nice stuff, so but I might be wrong. Um, and we know that since Cambridge Women's Aid was set up by the Cambridge Women's Liberation Network, that we have saved many, many lives and we have helped thousands of women and children. So we are very proud of what we have done. But we're still here. We're still new. That, that, that's not right. And actually, when I first came to work for Women's Aid, we celebrated 25 years of existence. We invited some of the women who set us up come to our party and they wouldn't come because they said we shouldn't still exist. We should have sorted it by now. And here we are, 45 years down the line, nearly 50, that's coming up. And yet still here, now, it's not great. So how's much changed in 45 years? I mean, yes, even in the 22 years that I've been working in Cambridge Music, loads has changed, there's huge awareness now. I think most people understand now what domestic abuse is. Agencies that used to not really care too much about domestic do now have a policy about it. They do realise that they have a duty to respond to it. Things are different. Some things have got better. And a really good place now, though, around the domestic abuse, around violence against women and girls, we're not going to go into that. So, what is domestic abuse? Just to be clear, what we're talking about, we're talking about domestic abuse. It is when one person seeks to dominate and control another person to remove their resources and to reduce their freedom. So a lot of it can be about things that might seem quite trivial from the outside, but actually add up to a total deprivation of liberty. It's not single acts, it's that multiple overlapping acts that we will see. So it might be controlling what you wear, where you go, how you see, what you eat, the experience of crushing micromanagement of your life. And so if she resents, there will be consequences, there will be punishment, Domestic abuse is not about anger issues or about arguments. It is about fear, and it's about consequence. So a commonly held explanation for abuse is that the perpetrator that he just lost control. But in fact, he's in very much in control. So we'll see outbursts of abusive behaviour that are highly calculated in order to maintain the control of the 
And so, when somebody did that, who, who perpetrates domestic abuse, we do not want their partner to do that at all. So in the case of actions, they're designed to weaken, to isolate, confuse, to wrong foot their partner. They don't want them to do well. They will constantly change the goalposts. They don't want the partner to get it right. There will be consequences for not getting it right. So the women that we support, they do not experience domestic abuse as single incidents. They will, they will have a continual experience, a continual assault of domestic abuse. It is a non-stop experience of abuse. So it's the remembering the experience of the abuse, the anticipating the abuse becomes all encompassing all of the time. How you gendered, and of course, resistance to an abuser who is stronger than you, who holds the power in your relationship is difficult or it is dangerous. So we would see the, the risk of harm, particularly with somebody that's leaving. So that, that is why we exist, because that danger still exists. We still see that, and that's why we do that. So the women's liberation. So, yeah, if you started further back, then you know, I don't want to much about it. But she came to the demands for the Women's Liberation Conference in 1970, this from Oxford. This is depressing, isn't it? So, the demands were for equal pay, still not there. Equal education, job opportunities, still not there. Free contraception and abortion demands, still not there. That, a lot of these things are going backwards, unfortunately. Free 24 hour nurseries, that's a great demand, wasn't it? How lovely would that be? Life changing, absolutely fantastic. So that period of consciousness raising, that naming of the problem, these demands are still not met. So you know, inequality was at the heart of this movement, and I think that's where we come to with around men's violence against women and girls. The inequality that, that, that led to these demands that we had here, we are now seeing that actually men's violence against women and girls is a manifestation of sexual inequality. And it's also the way the sex inequality is maintained. That has not changed. It's more that the individual acts perpetrated by individual men is a social and political issue and it continues to be so. And it's, it's, there's different conversations going on about it, absolutely. Actually, that fundamental fact has not changed. And so Sylvia Walby, who Professor Sylvia Walby, she speaks about private and public patriarchy. How it's private in homes and it's public in the outside world. So, Women learn to modify their behaviour, not to upset their partner, to try and reduce the consequences of getting it wrong, of upsetting the partner, putting the partner's needs first. But outside, of course, we also make innumerable small and large modifications to keep ourselves safe. So these two different types of patriarchy women are dealing with all the time. Sometimes they even flow, they might change in those different spheres, but it's still around. And we're not going to get equality in patriarchy. So I think shoehorning in you, usually quite privileged women to roles usually held by men, it doesn't cut out. That, that is not going to make this change. So actually we're, we need to do something quite different, I think. And while we wait, specialist services for women who have been subjected to men's violence, they are still needed. And they're needed because of what these men do to women and children. So the Women's Liberation Network, they set up in 1977, all these great women, Jane Isaacs, Deborah Ballard, Martha Lee, Janet Jenkins, Val Binney, Claire Weaver, Kate Colton, Naomi Redhouse, Errol Griffin, Anne Storm, and Nell Smarage. I just wanted to say their names because I think we all learned so much actually because this was not an easy thing to do back then at all. And the object was to relieve the need, the hardship, and the distress among women who had been persistently or greatly maltreated by men with whom they had been living and the children of those women. Providing refugees for women and children who enjoy temporary rest and protection from attack and persecution. I think temporary really sticks out there for me actually. We weren't we were hoping there was going to be a permanent solution to that. So these are the women. So it's very similar. I think I've got the same now. I only have the same as well. This is actually Audrey Vipon, who was our first ever paid worker. So this is the women sitting in Eden Street and they're discussing what, uh, what are the what are we going to do? How are we going to make it better? And so this is this is Audrey. And then again, sitting here, I think that's finally happening. We've got some coats on, they can afford you to the 70s either. So there we are. I was just talking about what needs to go on during the day. And so here's some of the committee members. We've got Claire Weaver, Francis Simmons, Doris Sadler, Penny Lockley, Evelyn Bradley. And this is the first refuge. 
this is what we got in 1977. So this is on the corner of John Street and Adam and Eve Street. There's a council house. Can you imagine how much this is worth now in Cambridge? But it's not a council house anymore, but we share with that. It's an internal estate, so again, getting given the poor properties. But then we've got Skip, we've got some husbands, but women were doing it for themselves, absolutely. They did a lot of stuff to do. So here we have the women that are taking the mattress in and mattress out. Stanley the Nickelman, who was a professional photographer, who took these brilliant photographs that we're so lucky to have today. And then they did things to repair the windows, they, they, they painted the ceilings. I hope they made the toilet better than that before they turned their eye. I hope that was not the only toilet. But I know from the workers, when I first started working for Cambridge during, say, 2001, speaking to workers who remember working in John Street. The, the office was under the stairs, and you had to be careful where you sat because it was always a bit high the pipe. And you just, if, you, if you weren't careful, it's going to land on your head if you sat inside. And then the women arrived. And the women came because they were absolutely desperate, because back then there was no protection. And even if, I think in 1976, there would have been a law around matrimonial violence, but it wasn't enforced. Women didn't get, well, they don't get, they don't get a, a good outcome in the courts now. They certainly didn't get it in the 1970s either. Um, and back then as well, if you were married, your husband was financially responsible for you. So if you were to leave, you weren't going to get benefits easily, you wouldn't face destitution. So that speaks to the desperation of the women who were coming to the refuge. And actually back then, even though Audrey was our first worker, that was until the 1980s. And so actually when the first women arrived, they were absolutely relying on these great women to volunteer their time. They took it in turns, they had their rota, they welcomed women, they, they, they looked after them, they went in. You know, and it wasn't great, of course it wasn't, but you know, it, it was better than where we were remaining where they were. And so they just, they begged, they stole the borrow that she's supposed to have it, and then just getting loads of stuff to and take to a jumble sale. And that's how they got, they got the stuff, the stuff um, that we need to, to have them. Then it wasn't about just providing a sticking plaster over the roof of the next few years. It was also about campaigning. And again, that has to be part and parcel of everything. We cannot just provide the services in response to domestic abuse. So this woman, whose name I cannot remember, it's fallen out of my head, but I have actually met her. She did come to our 25th anniversary at AGM. And she came because Audrey remembered her. And she knew that this child was working in borders in Cambridge. And we rang up borders to ask very randomly. And it was actually the person that answered the phone. This <laughs> little girl. And so she brought her mum along to the, to the thing. But she paused. Back steps of John Street. Enough is enough. She is not happy. She's got that fury in her, her face, which is brilliant. Battered women need refugees to rise. And look how the baby has the babies gone. So, set up as a collective, absolutely as the other said. But of course, our collective encompassed the, the trustees, the support group, the, the women who were employed, the volunteers, and the women who lived in the refuge. It was a, it was a Chaotic way to work. When I first worked in those days, we were still a collective. I loved that. That was one of the reasons I wanted to work for the children because I wanted to work in this collective. But it was a charity. First refuge opened. We've got Audrey. 1990, we've got a new refuge. Perkins Bill. That's the one that I remember. And I had a new street. And you go in, all the smoke, the cigarettes, it was terrible. Looking back now, honestly, there was poor children. There was a lot of smoking went on. Um, 2003, funding change. So up until that point, we had like a bit of a grant from the city council, a bit of bag of money every year, you get there, you go. A lot of our money would be, be charged with rent, which would get the housing benefit. But then it changed. Sport people came in, the county council then took over our funding. It felt particularly a little bit difficult for us, but that we went along with it. The city council, they still had money, so we asked them, can they fund our outreach service? But we were always asking us to meet them in Carrington's, in the Grafton Centre, to sit and have a with them about what was going on in their life and what informal service to support women who were living in our communities. And in 2005, we moved to another new purpose built new refuge because they built something next door to us. Who can guess what they built next door to us? The family court, the ones who are used to right now, they didn't know we were there. So they had to move us. So that was nice. That was fine. These are new objects. But still quite old fashioned, actually. I like the language. I'm not going to change it. We want to relieve the distress and suffering of women and children who have suffered or experienced domestic violence. We 
when children are uh, uh, relieved, they need financial grants of money or payment for services, vital services, IT facilities, and the preservation and protection of their health in such ways that contribute to relieving their needs. Also, educating the public, partner agencies, the colleagues of their employers, and prevention of them. And again, that's us. Having those conversations, not just providing the speaking faster services that we all want. So, what can we do? In a nutshell, with domestic abuse, we've got to recognise how domestic abuse reduces a woman. It's like a concrete overcoat over her. She, 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 it takes away the things that she needs to live well, it takes away the resources, it takes away her resilience, it deprives her of being able to contribute to our society and want her to do. So it strips away her sense of self, deprives her of the ability to live her life, it removes vital research and resources from her reach because, of course, the best can do something to that. The real partner who's perpetrating the best and that done that, he does that purposefully. And so, what we often hear from agencies and the working with the women is that she should do this and she should do that, actually. She can't, she has no space for action to do those things. And so, what we must do create space of action for her to do that. So space of action might be physical space, bringing resources into her life, advice, support, friendship, care, whatever that will look like. So in current times, we've got a safe refuge for living women and their children. We have an Irish support service where women came to sit inside cans and use cans. This was much bigger until October last year. We had a significant cut in our funding. We do direct support by phone, email, text. Really meeting that woman wherever she is, what is it that she needs us 24 hour on call. And that's, that sounds like, oh, we must be awake all the time. We're not, but we do want to be there that when that woman has that window of opportunity to make that call, she can do that. And I think services now, a lot of women believe that women just going to knock on their door saying, hello, I'm a victim of domestic violence and I demand my service. But of course they don't. They want to talk, they want to discuss, they want to understand what might their options be if, if they told somebody what would happen, what support might be available for them. Is it even domestic abuse? Because it's like, you know, being a frog getting boiled and just gradually creeps up on you and suddenly you've got to make sense of it. It's very, very difficult. So actually having a place where we can call to have those conversations with the early on in the matters. If they ask me community education programme, there's lots of training for the police and social services and housing. But actually the people who are going to know about domestic abuse in our communities, our families, our neighbours, our employees, our employees. So actually that's something that anybody can join in to find more about domestic abuse, about how you can break the silence around that, how you can respond to, how you can respond to it. We do peer support and mental health groups. There's nothing so powerful when you're a woman in trouble and finding your tribe, women that have got those shared experiences with you. So we always want to bring women together to give opportunities for them to support each other. And the mental health groups, we don't really want to be able to provide them, but actually nobody else is. So we have to access mental health support that actually understands who you are and what you need, it's, it, it, it's miles away from where we need to be. So we are, we are providing that partnership with, with, with other groups. We're collecting and distributing resources, whether that's money, or food, or furniture, or comforting, or, or whatever it is that somebody needs. We do an awful lot of work bringing them into refuge and then resetting them back out. We become part of our community and that will be the same as they want. We partnership working with a lot of partners that we love. Cambridge Crisis, Cambridge Teresa Centre. Some are not that keen on, but it's so important that we do so And our current issues. Moving into post COVID times, and I think it's not just about maybe having an expectation that we deliver differently to how we did before. And that's right, because we do have to, to move and evolve. But it's also about how difficult things have become. So that's how to call it. But actually, society has shifted, it's changed as, as, as things have changed. So, you spoke, I think, or, or Steph did about the higher needs of new complexity. How are we delivering our services? What is it that people actually need, what we naturally need when they come to us? We need alternative space. During COVID, we had um, very kind of we were given the forms to accommodation at St. Catherine's College to use just as we wanted, as we needed. That was amazing. To be able to say to anyone coming to us, I um, don't feel safe at home, just say, yeah, come right now. Come. No question about it. Affordability, or you know, what, 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 what's actually, she should just come, we could just sort her out once she's safe and she had that space. We don't really have that, that luxury anymore. We need to have alternative spaces that particularly local women are safe to come to. 
domestic abuse act, we've been at the debate, been campaigning for years, expecting this to be the answer to all of our prayers. But there's a lot of difficulties that come with that, so there's now a duty for all statutory services to do the little bit of domestic abuse. Actually, you've seen women who have been failed by a thousand ineffective interventions and actually not having the sight of the special services anymore because they're just going to a little bit of help, a little bit of police, a little bit of social services, a little bit of handcuffs. And so not actually finding the women that can give them the support and the advice they want to have what they want to do. Reduction of the general safety net. So when we run refuge, we expect that if we call the police, the police will come, we run an ambulance, and we'll not wait 10 hours when women's having a psychotic episode. This is where we are. And so what do we do? So actually the work that we're now doing is so many times just filling the same, those gaps that have now come in the safety net. And that, that, that's making our, our, our work incredibly difficult. Um, because these women are, we should have, they should have access to just basic services. And they've just got out the window. And it just means that special services now we're just completely overwhelmed actually. Um, money mechanisms. How has it become so complicated for us to get money? In the olden days, a nice man from the council would come once a year, give them a bag of money, and say, There you go, see you next year. There's very huge departments, and make us do little bands, and then it's make us jump through hoops, and make us do huge big procurement exercises just to get in the money that we all used to have, and then be very crazy. I don't know where we got here, it's just insane, and it is. But we're seeing shrinking special services. When we lost our Irish funding in October, it's because County Council decided not to fund. The services that we did this work for the Cambridge Women's Aid, Cambridge Women's Aid, National Organisation Rescue, they decided to fund a gender neutral service provided by a housing association. So, how to do various ways to give women access to services. And again, this is a service where they have to knock on the door very, very loudly in order to be heard. I, I cannot, I, I'm actually lost for words, I can't explain to you how we've got to where we are. So on we go though, because actually women trust us, they want to come to our service, they're going to come to our service. So we need to invite them in the service, they don't want to go to a man's service in their child. If you answer, there's an answer for a message that is actually by a man. So women don't, that's not what they want, they don't trust them. And so we see a lack of joint thinking nationally and locally. The understanding that actually our special service would be a whole is the community resources. We've built them up over decades. And actually we cannot just take a leave it and give it off somewhere else and have that service anymore, it just isn't going to happen. So I'll leave you just with what does a specialist women's domestic abuse service look like, it's them down. But it is run by organisations whose core business is working with us against women and girls. We are experts in that. We are independent from the state. We cannot be employed by the county council or similar to do the work that we do. We've got to be created by women for women. But to have that live balance against men and girls experience that we sent to throughout our organisation, the local grassroots independent, trusted by women, available in emergency, we need somebody to pick up the phone and talk to you. It's got to be needs led, gender responsive, understanding intersectional inequalities, understanding all the things that that perpetrator understands about that woman's characteristics that he is going to use to every effect, to trip her up and to make you stop her from like, getting support that she needs. And this is not hard. Trained staff for international quality standards. You don't remember the water, it's from the office, we should come back from it. There's no chance of going to So contact us, go to our website, but this Ask Me program, honestly, come and join us. We would love it, maybe we get a lot out of it. But I think some of you in the audience have done it, so we can recommend it to others as well. But it's finding out about domestic abuse, be able to speak it more comfortably and to be able to know what to do if you spot it, how to respond to it, and to, because actually it's no more, we don't just say well we don't commit domestic abuse, we want to be anti, we don't say that we're not sexist, we want to be anti-sexist, we don't say we're not misogynist, we want to be anti-misogynistic, so it's not just about saying well we don't behave in that way, but what do we do to create that change, to stop people from behaving in that way, to get that shift.
So what we need now is how would that happen? Yeah, but a high rat. But a high rat. So when these funding came in, it's supporting people. They watch the roof of the buck stop, and they collect the buck stops and nobody knows who's going to give us money. We were the second last collector to call Manchester for conference. But when we see Manchester, when we say conference, we think it's really easy. You have one for as long as you could. But we tried to retain our collective power. So actually, even though we are a higher ranking, we do have responsibility. There is now a change in wages before I started. There was no, everybody was paid exactly the same. But we try and keep it, keep it, you know, without it being too out of control. And actually, at the end of the day, whenever we make decisions, we want it and collect it whenever we can. Actually, it just, it's great having women around you who all want to do the thing rather than you the boss and the thing. I think really want to do the thing. Do you know of any um, local organisations working with shelters and any organisations working with men? So, I would thank you for your presentation. It was really interesting. It's very complicated because I would say to you perpetrate programs do not work. And I would say to you that perpetrate programs actually make women less safe because you give them hope that he will change if he goes to a program. He will not. It's very, very unlikely that he will change if he goes to a program. And actually there's not a lot of evidence to persuade us otherwise. However, if an area is correct, is, is, is intelligent, they can have an approach around giving them perpetrators. But I think we need to get better at understanding perpetrators. So maybe we've got good understanding of different typologies and different types of domestic abuse. We need to understand the different typologies of abusers actually, what will, what will work. So we've been tinkering around the edges locally that if a man is first offence, it's just a little minor thing, he admits that he's sorry, she knows that he's sorry, then we can go on the weekend. So I think I'm getting caught for sleep. Should we be spending our money doing that? Is, is that the thing? I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not too sure, I'm not convinced. There is, however, there's going to be a uh, tender that's coming out from the Decent Crime Commission's office for there to be perpetrator work done locally. The key will be in who does it, so respect the national organisation, a lot of respect for respect, they do it properly. They will say actually sometimes the most effective thing that the perpetrator programme does is it occupies the perpetrator and the work can be done with the woman who's experiencing it, maybe she can. So that if you are interested in this, is uh, the Mirabel research um, that did, did come out and it tried to do some evaluation of perpetrator programs, but it wasn't that clear actually if she's feeling less safe, she was feeling more safe because of the perpetrator program or because she had left the relationship because of the support that she'd been getting. So it's still quite a muddy area and it's, it's not it's not magic wand at all. But I think it's a lot of the prevention. So what around what is it that in society that feeds these men's entitlements and behaviour disorders? So there's a lot around that that both can just work just to present the Social, cultural, and structural around the 
racial violence uh, and rape. So our beginnings really as a kind of as our beginnings really as a rape crisis centre, and I think our movement as a global network really began in January 1971 in a small church called St Clements where the first speak out was held. So at the speak out, 40 women stood up before an audience of 300 and spoke out for the first time about their experiences of having been subjected to rape and sexual abuse. And I think in that moment, the silence of sexual violence was broken and the rape crisis movement was born. And our rape crisis centre here in Cambridge really has its roots and heritage enshrined in that moment. So we are a movement built by and for survivors, with survivors' voices at the heart of everything we do, and that has not changed for the last 40 years. So as Elo, Steph and Andrew have already said, women's activism in the late 1970s and early 80s really changed the landscape of women in Cambridge. Women began to self-organise, to deal with the issues that were affecting their lives at that time, where there was absolutely no form of support structures in place, and a complete lack of state focused policy or care about the harms that women and girls were being subjected to. And as a result of that, a number of grassroots women's organisations came into being in Cambridge and of course are still going today, which I think is amazing. But over the past 40 years, we have had to really nurture our organisations to grow and to flourish against some very complicated and changing and unpredictable ways of the both political and economic landscapes, shifting funding priorities and the impacts of harmful social and cultural responses to sexual violence and abuse. So Cambridge Rape Crisis, we're a grassroots organisation who was set up in 1982 by a group of local women who I think came together because they recognised the desperate need for safe space and protected time for women to come together break the silence around sexual violence and to support each other in their healing and recovery from the trauma of those experiences and ultimately to create social change and demand better outcomes for survivors. And just to give you a little bit of historical context, two years after we started, so in 1984, Sir Kenneth Newman, who was the Metropolitan Police Commissioner at the time, famously said, domestic violence and stray dogs is rubbish work. After we were set up in 1982, it would be another 10 years before rape within marriage became unlawful, and another 21 years before we saw the Sexual Offences Act of 2003 coming to force, replacing the awful outdated Act of 1956. And it wasn't until the mid-1990s that the first national framework to tackle child sexual abuse was published in this country. So literally every day, we appreciate and thank our family members women who built the forums, they were absolute pioneers of their time and their dedication and tireless activism has helped shape, shape some of those changes in the world we live in today. So, not dissimilar at all from the Women's Resources Centre and Women's Aid, when we first started, we were entirely volunteer-led and run. It would be about another decade before the first paid work joined the organisation. We were and continue to be led by and for women. So basically at the heart of what we do is women supporting women. We also ran as a collective, so had a completely flat structure. And collective working, as we've already said, is a beautiful thing, but not without its challenges. I think what the women were trying to do at that time was to create alternative structures to work in that did not emulate hierarchical or power, power structures. Consciousness raising was really key to that work in those early days. Creating space for women to develop our own language and understanding and making sense of the oppressive systems that existed at the time. Trying to find our own words and language to describe and to bear witness to each other's experiences of sexual violence. So activism, challenge and change really drove the work. And the organisation really kept the state at arm's length for a long time. And when, when many grassroots groups and organisations fall to address oppressive or discriminatory systems, it can be a really important part of the early journeys of those organisations to keep
keep the distance from the systems and the structures that either ignore or contribute to the harms that that group are trying to address. So the original ethos for us as a rape crisis centre sought to recognise the harms of sexual violence across four interlocking dimensions, personal, cultural, social and structural. So grassroots feminist support services such as our rape crisis centre have historically combined political analysis of sexual violence with support for its personal impacts. So individual recovery and social revolution are really key goals of our intervention. So core and centre of what we do today as we did 40 years ago is to provide specialist support services. But surrounding that is all the work we commit to do to making the world a better place for survivors of sexual violence. So we urge to improve local and national policies. We educate to change and challenge harmful and stereotypes, fight for legislative reform, and insist on improving law enforcement. So most rape crisis centres started with running a confidential telephone helpline service. For many centres, our helplines remain the main support service that we delivered for a number of years. But in conversations with women and girls over time, it became apparent that survivors wanted to be needed access to more and different types of specialist support. This list of services that you see here on this slide is what we offer today, and what all brought about as a result of what women and girls told us that they wanted so it now includes counselling, talking therapies, an advocacy service, group work, and support for their supporters. We have also stayed true to our commitment to tackle the causes of sexual violence as well as deal with its consequences. So we expand our community outreach work, our training and awareness raising, and prevention work with young people in schools and educational settings. And we also sit on a number of local, regional, and national violence against women and girls strategic boards to primarily ensure that the voice of survivors are heard at every level by those with decision-making responsibility for policy and resourcing. Now, all of the work that you see listed here wasn't really possible without us evolving as an organisation and developing and expanding. And part of that, across the whole Great Crisis Network, was a kind of professionalisation journey that we went on. So probably one of the most significant changes we underwent was about a decade ago with the development and adoption of our rape crisis national service standards. So our national service standards are a robust set of specialist quality standards and help us ensure that no matter where a survivor lives, they will receive consistent, high quality services from any member of rape crisis centre. As organisations who meet these standards, we have to demonstrate that we are independent. We are community-based and work from a trauma-informed perspective. We also, of course, have robust governance structures and an awesome group of women who are our trustees who oversee the work that we do. And some of our trustees were involved in the organisation back in the 80s, some are former workers, volunteers, service users, and some are women who are very new to the violence against women in the world sector. We also have a really, really brilliant really skilled workforce with access to professional qualifications. So we ensure that everyone involved in our and delivering services are trained and highly skilled to fully understand all forms of sexual violence so that we educate ourselves so that survivors don't have to do the work for us. And this makes for a safe, reliable space for which to speak out, be listened to, and to be believed. Of course, in any period of growth and change, it can be really exciting, um, but it can also bring risks with it. And there is the risk of losing something of the essence of who we were. So we've actually paid a lot of attention and been very watchful for potential risks and losses with that transformation. Really mindful that we never create distance for other survivors that we work with. And we recognise that we are women supporting women. It's you today and it's me tomorrow. We didn't ever want to become so outward driven, just focused on the point that we got to rather than noticing the journey we took. I think as a sector, we have a very heavy over-reliance on oral history and oral storytelling. And we're really concerned that we want to keep that going because it's really important that women from our past tell the next generation of rape crisis worker about how we can be 
unless we forget to change the world. We never want to become process focused, but to remain people focused. Processes are really important, but they must never become the world. And it's really critical for us as an organisation that we don't become overly risk averse. In the work we do, we sometimes have to take a leap of faith, hide something. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But the greatest risk for us at the Great Crisis Centre is to do nothing. So being risk averse is really poor for our development and growth as an organisation. We never want to design services that benefit others. And by that I mean, for example, changing our eligibility criteria, shrinking it to fit the resource. We want to grow the resource to meet the need. And that's really important. Keep the funds to avoid some As Angie's already said, we have some complicated relationships with dependency, often with funders or institutions that we are trying to so it's a complex thing to need to learn the PT. So it's been really, really important for us as a great crisis centre that we stay true to our roots and appreciate those who look for us. So we've done that in a number of ways that we've kind of enshrined in our organisation. We never forget that we are simply the current caretakers of our great crisis centre. It doesn't belong to us as staff, volunteers, or trustees, but it will always belong to the we are simply the current caretakers, hopefully living in a better place than what we found it. I would say one of the great things that we have kept from the principles of collective working is the practice of positive power sharing, ensuring that as women we feel comfortable and supported to take up leadership roles and to have power, but to use it positively and mindfully and always share it. We are, of course, our so when we've achieved and secured change, whether that's through resources or legislation or shifts in attitudes, we then have to guard those aims to ensure they're not diluted or eroded, which we're seeing happening sort of globally. So it's not enough that we've got them, we then have a lifetime's commitment to keeping and protecting them. We are incredibly proud and unapologetic to be a values led organisation. And we appreciate and recognise every single woman's contribution to our organisation. What she does for her involvement, whether she's a paid worker, a volunteer, or a service user. We also have to be really courageous and be unafraid to be unpopular. We often have to stand up still in hostile environments to speak truth to power in contested areas. This can sometimes mean that nobody wants to be our friend, nobody wants to sit with us at the lunch break, and that's absolutely fine because we know that any social justice. History shows us this. When social reform is taking place, we are asking people to let go of harmful structures and systemic oppressive practice, there will be resistance and no more so than now. A celebration and joy helps to help hold the hope for a better future for change, peace, and safety in women and girls' lives. So we take every opportunity to celebrate and acknowledge the strength, courage, and resilience of the amazing women. We know what a huge privilege it is that women and girls trust us and invite us to travel alongside them on their journey to become them. We also still work from a human rights perspective and use feminist analysis in our work so we see the bigger, broader issues and the power dynamics that play out in sexual violence. We know that sexual violence is a cause and consequence of gender inequality in our society. The rape crisis uh, and power it's all of the work that we do, at its core, believes that every survivor is the expert in her own life and her own recovery. We trust the believing survivors to make the right choices and decisions for themselves. We are needs led and survivor focused, and co production and collective growth are used in the development of all that we do. And we absolutely nurture our community of volunteers and staff, and we know that well being. So some of the challenges that we are facing, um, both as a rate crisis and here in Cambridge, but we're seeing this happen nationally, around our services and resourcing, and Angie touched on quite a lot of these. We are seeing an increase year on year in the demand for our services. So during the two years of the pandemic, we saw a 183% increase in demand for our counselling services. Sadly, our funding didn't increase at the same rate. So we're now managing the point of view, which literally 
Now we know that recovery from sexual violence is not time limited and it's not linear. So neither are our support services. But we are often trying to deliver long-term support using short-term funding, and that is a really important point. This also means that we've received highly skilled and experienced staff. Our contracts are really short, our funding is really short term. Now we are just successful at drawing in funds to run frontline services, but the infrastructure needed to support those services is under much harder to come by. Nobody wants to fund the light bulbs and the toilet bulbs, but this is what we need to run our centre. We spend a lot of time chasing the elusive support funding. If we become aware of an emerging issue in the lives of women and girls in the world, we want to be able to respond. But often there's a real time lag at the point where we recognise an emerging issue and we can get resources to deal with it. There is an increasing focus on funding for new and innovative projects, whilst neglecting the need for more established and well evident services being supported long term. And the changing landscape of funding, commissioning, and the impact of the localism agenda has really affected us. Commissioning through competitive tendering turn potential partners in our sector into competitors. It feels like a form of privatising the third sector. The localism agenda, whilst the great idea and principle to devolve local decision making into local people, doesn't work so well if those with decision making power have little or no understanding of sexual violence or the needs of survivors. And of course, as has already been touched on this evening, it's impossible for us to think about our work without acknowledging the change in support needs survivors as a result of the pandemic and the cost of living crisis. So it really feels like now is the time for us to keep pushing for social change and for sustainably resourced specialist services because the true scale of sexual violence by individuals in positions of power, trust and authority, by groups and within institutions is only really starting to be revealed. We know that some social and structural challenges that we face on a daily basis at our rape crisis centre haven't changed significantly over the last 40 years. We are seeing catastrophic failings within the criminal justice system. The government uh, published an end-to-end -end rape review the summer before last, fully acknowledging, uh, acknowledging and apologising for the fact that the criminal justice system is failing victims and survivors of sexual violence. The drop in prosecutions and evictions of offenders is a national disgrace and it's causing a huge loss of faith and trust in the system for women and girls. Many survivors don't want the criminal justice outcome. They're seeking parallel justice, such as access, easy access to specialist support such as counselling without long waiting times. For those who see their recovery and healing as a way to gain redress of the harms done to them. We are still far too often seeing local and national policy decisions being shaped by harmful myths and stereotypes, whether that's rape prevention campaigns that maintain victim blaming or police investigations that focus on the behaviour of the victim and not the perpetrator. National resourcing of policy is often focused on what's described as incidents of recent sexual violence that does not give the same priority to historic sexual violence and abuse. So creating a hierarchy of needs and notions of deserving. But actually, we know that all survivors of sexual violence and abuse, whether recent or historic, are deserving of support as and when they need it. There is, as well, a real lack of recognition of the distinct needs of survivors from minoritized or underrepresented communities. And I think this often leads to assumptions that generic support services can meet these needs without an intersection approach in their work. And of course, we're seeing a really, really worrying increase in far-right groups with misogynistic ideologies, such as INCEL, which stands for involuntarily celibate. So this is an online, an online subculture of men who define themselves as unable to get a romantic or sexual partner despite wanting one. So discussions in INCEL forums are often characterised by resentment and hatred, misogyny, a sense of entitlement to sex and the endorsement of violence. 